Well, good morning again. Um, I'm Pastor Jason, one of the elders here at Grace Bible Church, and I only mention that because I know we have a lot of visitors today. And I just want to, again, welcome you on behalf of Grace Bible Church. We're glad you're here. Um, you're coming today at a good time. It's a baby dedication. It's a good time to be here. Um, today, we, uh, as far as our, our worship series or study that we're doing right now, we're in Revelation, and you're kind of joining us midstream. So feel free to jump in, hop in with us. Today, we're in Revelation chapter 4. It's a pretty short chapter, but it's pretty thick as far as what it contains. It's 11 verses. I'd like to read it, and then we'll just kind of talk about it today. Uh, Revelation chapter 4. And if you've been, been with us for a while, you know we've been talking about uh, the name of our series is Unveiled. And that's really what um, the entire book is about. It's the unveiling or the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we, in this book, see Jesus more clearly, he shows us more about himself. Um, he talks, he gives a vision to John in chapter 1 of himself. Um, different aspects of that vision are pulled out in chapters 2 and 3 as Jesus addresses these seven churches and kind of deals with different issues, concerns, challenges, obstacles, uh, things that they're doing well um, in addition to that. And then Jesus is, is sort of uh, revealing himself and then addressing these seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. And then we come to chapter 4, and this thing takes a whole left turn, or right turn, depending on how you're looking at it. But it's a, it definitely departs from what we've been uh, talking about. But chapter 4 represents a departure in sort of the, the timeline and sort of the content, in some ways, of what we've been seeing. But the thing that does not change is, is it is still the Lord Jesus Christ being revealed. It's a different scenario. There's sort of some different... Uh, things in this, some imagery and so forth that may um, may attract our attention, which is good. They're important things. But the thing that has not changed is it's still Jesus. It's still Jesus on display. It's still His holiness, His uh, divinity, His uh, His righteousness, His judgment, His wrath, His love. I mean, all of that Jesus is is still is still on display, but maybe in a little different way. So let's read chapter four together, and we're going to get a vision. Um, through the Apostle John of the throne room of God. So let's read uh, again, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1. John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Verse 2, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings or four, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before him, or before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, and uh, even as we approach this, uh, these 11 verses of chapter 4, which in many ways are enigmatic, puzzling, uh, there's a lot of imagery, there's uh, lots of things to attract our attention, uh, lots of things to, to, to hold it there and not let it go. Uh, but Father, we pray that we would take 
from these words the encouragement that you would have us uh, to receive, that you would uh, instruct us, that you would uh, admonish us, encourage us, whatever it is that your word uh, desires to do today, may your spirit have your way and to teach us uh, from it. Instruct us, help us to apply what we're learning, help us to see clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a lot in this chapter, and even as we were reading this, I mean, there's a lot to sort of get like rabbit trails to go down. There's this verse one, which is all of this uh, about after these things, after this, after this, after this, after what? So there's like a whole trail there that we can kind of go down, and we'll investigate that in just a minute. What what is what is he saying? What is this vision of heaven and this? What does it represent? So there's kind of that. Uh, there's also you've got these this throne room of God and all these colors. You got these jasper, emerald, carnelian, all of that. What does that mean? And then you've got these twenty four elders. Who are they? What are they doing? What are what's what's the kind of the point with that? And who who are these people? Uh, well, are they people? Maybe even is a question we need to ask. And then we see these four living creatures. Like what what are these things? Are they the angels? Are they symbols? Or what are there's all sorts of just kind of different things that we could really focus our attention uh, on in this chapter, and all of them would be worthy of some some airtime, okay? Some spiritual airtime, like that we could delve into that area. It would be productive in some way to investigate um, each of those aspects. Um, but if there were like one thing on display in this chapter that I think is probably the the most important, the the thing that as we look at the elders, we look at the creatures. You know, we look at everything that's going on in there, like this throne room of God. What are all of these, what's the activity consist of? Okay, we're here reading this vision. There are things that attract our attention. But those who are in heaven with God, what's attracting their attention? And it is the holiness of God. And so that's really the thing that we want to come back to. I'm going to kind of mention it now. We're going to come back around to that. But it's this idea that God is holy. His holiness is on display in this scene, and it is what is commanding the attention of whoever these people, creatures are. Holy, holy, holy. Worthy are you to receive all glory, honor, power. What does that even, what does that mean to say God is holy? It means he's set apart. The word holy is, is from Greek, uh, excuse me, Hebrew word which means to be cut off. It means to be cut off, to be separate, to be unique, different, apart, but in a special kind of way. So God is, he is, he's holy. And that's what's really commanding the attention of this, of everyone in this scene. So, but anyway, let's come back to that in just a moment, but I want to go back to verse one for a moment, because this is really something we've, we've been talking about the last few weeks. Um, Jesus in chapter one of Revelation gives us an outline for the rest of the book in verse 19. He says there's really three divisions to this revelation that he's giving to John the Apostle. He said to John, he said, first I want you to write down what you have seen. And that ends up being chapter 1, the vision of Jesus. Uh, secondly, Jesus tells John to write down the things which are. Okay, present tense things. And that really can, uh, is... The, the basis for chapters 2 and 3, the things that are, the letters to the churches. Jesus is observing the churches. He's saying, this is what's going on. This is my appraisal of it. Present tense, things, things that are. So we've got chapter 1, things you have seen. Chapters 2 and 3, things that are. And then Jesus says, interestingly, thirdly, to John in verse 19, he says, I want you to also write the things which will take place meta tauta after these things. He uses a very specific Greek phrase, and so meta tauta, after this, or after these things. Well, interestingly enough, in chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus it, it sort of inserts into our text here that same phrase, meta tauta, twice. After this, meta tauta, after these things. I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place, meta, tauta, after these things. And so the question comes up, after, after what things? Well, these things that 
that are going to be in chapter 4 and following, we believe, are future things. This is Jesus inserting into the text a marker that shows us the, the, the dividing point between the things that are and the things which will take place. And so at the time John is receiving this writing from Jesus in 95, 96 AD, whenever that was, these things were yet future things. And we, we believe, not all Christians believe this, but we believe that the things that are going to be written about in chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and following are things that are still future for us today. We believe that. Um, there, it is debatable. We'll kind of get into some of that maybe later, but we believe that these are still future things. And chapter 4, verse 1 is the dividing point uh, in that, that timeline, that chronology. So, so not only do we have the phrase, after this, which sort of serves as a marker, but we also have this question, like after, it says after these things, after what things? Like there's a reference to something preceding that, after these things, what things? What, what has been in view in the last two chapters? It's been the churches. And so we, again, we believe that this verse not only represents that he's going to be talking about future things, but it's going to be after the things of the churches. In other words, it's after the church age. Uh, we believe as Christians in uh, the return of our Lord Jesus, not only to rule and reign, which is talked about all through Scripture, but we also believe that Jesus is going to come back. Uh, we believe it is a separate event. He's going to come back for his church in an event that we commonly call the rapture. Okay, um, And some Christians or people will point out, they'll say, well, wait a minute, what is this rapture thing? Is that even biblical? The word rapture is not even in the Bible. Well, actually, we believe that it is in the Bible, and I want to show you where it is. Um, if you'll turn with me, because I think this is, is important. It's kind of key to what we're going to understand in the rest of this book. Uh, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about an event that we believe is consistent with chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation, after these things, that, that there's coming a, a moment when Jesus is going to end the church age. He's going to come back for his church, and then there's going to be a, a time, which we'll see chronicled in Revelation, a time of judgment that will come to pass upon the earth. And so chapter 4, verse 1 seems to be that transitional moment. Now, more descriptively, Paul writes about this moment in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the coming of the Lord, beginning in verse 13. And he says to, to the Thessalonians concerning the return of the Lord, he says this, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. He's talking about Christians who have died, who have physically died, they've passed on, they're buried. Um, and, and Paul says, listen, he goes, I don't want you to be ignorant of these things about, about what's going on with them. Okay? He says that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Do you know that we as Christians, we, we grieve when our loved ones pass away? But we grieve with hope that we will see them again. We will go to be with the Lord with them, and we will, um, we will see them again. So even, you know, when my mother passed away, um, there was definitely, it was a devastating event. She died fairly young, you know, 50, 56, I think, of cancer. And so just remember that moment. I remember thinking, yes, this is painful, it's tragic, but I have hope that I will see her again. She's a believer. I'm a believer. We know the promises of the Lord. We can grieve, we do grieve, but not without hope. And here's the hope. Paul tells us, he says, this is the hope. Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, okay, on that basis, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. In other words, Paul's saying, this is not my opinion, this isn't wishful thinking, this is not just, we kind of hope it's this way. Paul says, no, we declare to you by a word from the Lord. This is the Lord's truth that he is sharing uh, for us. And he says that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of, of the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now listen, here it comes. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. The word there in Greek, harpazo, means to be snatched up, to be caught away, to be, to be taken up. It says, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Uh, not only do we have 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but we also have John chapter 14, a familiar passage. Uh, Jesus says to the disciples, John 14 verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If it were not so, um, but he's not saying it's not so. He said, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? It's interesting. He says in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. Okay, that where I am, you may be also. Okay, we believe that both of these passages, and there are others, but these are probably the two of the best passages. These teach the event that we know is the rapture, Jesus coming back for his church to take us away. There we have that word, catching away, taking away, taking away of us to be with him. And so there's this idea that Jesus is saying, he says, I'm going to my father's house. We know that to be heaven, right? And he said, it's there where he's going to prepare the place for us to be with him. And he says, he's going to take us to be with him, not the other way around. Okay, it's not the other way around. We're going to be caught up to be with him and go where he is, not the other way around. And so there are some who, I think, sort of see the, the return of the Lord to rule and reign here on earth as the same event as the rapture which doesn't really make sense because why would we go up to meet him in the clouds just to come back here? No, we're going to go be with him where he is. And so that we believe that that is a very important transitional event that's not really taught in Revelation 4, chapter 1, but it's alluded to in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And so it's really that event, we believe, that sets the stage for what's about to happen next. So what we see, we see in chapter 4, really a vision of the throne room of God where we're seeing these, these rumblings, these lightnings, these peals of thunder, which are all a, a, a sign of what? When, when it's thundering, when it's lightning, what, what's coming? Storm is coming, right? We hear it in the distance. We see the, the leaves start to turn up, and you see the silver undersides of the leaves. You know the, the rain's coming, right? You know that that's on its way. Chapter 4, we're beginning to see... The judgment of God is about to hit this planet, this world system. God is about to reveal himself in a never-before-seen way in judgment and wrath on this planet. And similarly to, we believe, similarly to God coming and taking Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah before it was destroyed, similarly to God preserving Noah and the other seven in the ark, before God's judgment hit in the form of the flood, we believe, too, that what Jesus is talking about in John 14 is that he's coming back for us before this cataclysmic, apocalyptic judgment hits this planet, and Jesus sets up his throne and takes uh, charge of the world the way it was designed to be. So all of that said, and we spent a lot of time there, but chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation is an important, we believe, transitional event that sets the stage for what is to come next, future things. But Jesus, uh, going back to Revelation 4 here, uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 2, um, it goes on to say that uh, John says he was in the Spirit. Now, several folks in the Bible have have had this vision of the throne room of God and uh, Paul was confused. He said, I don't, he said, when I saw it, I don't know if I was in the body or in the spirit. I just, I don't even know. <laughs> He's just being honest. But John says, no, I was in the spirit and, and, and I, this is what I saw. This was the vision I was given. He says, behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Now that's encouraging. And, and there's a lot of this stuff that can be a little scary here. There's a lot of things we see in the news that are a little scary. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of stuff. Even the song we sang about, like some of the stuff 
that can just happen in life. You know, death, sickness. Uh, we have a plan. That plan doesn't happen. Something else happens, wrecks that plan. You know, we have expectations. We have things that just, that just don't go as planned, and it seems like we have no control over it. But an encouragement here is, is this verse, verse 2. It says that there is one seated on the throne. And when we come to understand who that is and the nature of his being seated on the throne, that he is immovable. He is eternal. He has always sat on the throne. He currently sits on the throne. He will always sit on the throne, un, unfazed, un, 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 unable to be deposed. He, he cannot be removed from this throne. Like God is permanently, effectually in control. He will always be in control. And that, in some ways, is, can be very scary, but to the believer can be very comforting. And so we'll come back to that thought. But he's on the throne. It says, verse 3, He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was this rainbow. Normally we think of a rainbow, multiple colors. But this one says it has the appearance of an emerald. What color is an emerald? Kind of a, a green, right? So Jasper and Carnelian, you may not be familiar with those, but they're reddish colored stones, semi-precious gemstones, used commonly in jewelry in the, the ancient world. Uh, Jasper and Carnelian. Carnelian is also known as Sardius or Sardine stone. Jasper and, and Sardinius or Carnelian and Emerald, by the way. All three of those stones are mentioned uh, way back in Ezekiel chapter 28. And you know where they were located, what they were used for? They're actually used as three, the three of the 12 stones that, were, that God commanded to be set into the, the breastplate of judgment that was worn by the priesthood, okay? I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Okay, so the breastplate of judgment was worn by the priests, okay? So this breastplate of judgment had like three rows of four of these stones, each stone representing a tribe of Israel. And so I think it's interesting, John could have just said, yeah, I got up there and the one who sat on the throne, he, he kind of looked reddish. He doesn't actually say that. He actually references these two stones, which are interesting because they're connected with the breastplate of judgment. Uh, some people even go a little further with this, and they say significantly that the jasper is the, uh, the first stone mentioned, and the um, Sard Sardinius or Carnelian is the last stone mentioned. So those would be connected with Reuben and Benjamin on the breastplate, which if you kind of investigate what, what that means, um, it speaks of... Uh, Reuben uh, is really saying, behold, my son. And Benjamin, you may remember Benjamin, what Benjamin's name means, the son of my power or the son of my right hand. And so in some sense, and I don't think it's inaccurate to say that uh, the vision that John is getting, the vibe he's getting from this throne room is a vision of judgment, but it's also at the same time saying, behold, my son the son of my right hand, the son of my power. So we see these stones, we see these, these colors around the throne, 24 elders. We'll come back to them in a moment. Flashes of lightnings, rumblings, or voices, peals of thunder. He said that kind of speaks of impending judgment. Um, and so there's uh, these 24 elders. We have these four living creatures. We'll kind of talk, talk briefly about those as well. Um, well, actually, let's just, let's just talk about the elders since we're here. 24 thrones, seated on the thrones, 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. If we skip to the end, what are these 24 elders doing? It says in verse 9, they, um, or excuse me, verse 10, they fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him. That's their activity. That's what they look like. That's where they're seated. That's what they're wearing. That's what they're doing. They're worshiping him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne. It's interesting. It's where the name, the, you've heard this singing group, Casting Crowns. This is where it comes from. Casting Crowns. What are they doing? They're casting their crowns. They're casting their crowns before the throne. Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive honor, glory, power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So who are these elders? Well, I'm going to let you down here and tell you, <laughs> we don't know. 
<laughs> we don't know specifically who they are. Okay, there's lots of conjectures. There's lots of guesses. Are these the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel or something? We don't, we don't know. It doesn't tell us who they are. But what we do have insight into, because of what they're wearing, white garments, who wears the white garments in the book of Revelation? The overcomers. It's those that he's been referencing, the, those who faithfully, obediently follow Christ and walk with him, are described throughout the book of Revelation. It's really clear when we get to the end. These are, somehow, these are, these are saints who have overcome, that they have been found faithful and obedient through a period of testing, trial, walking with the Lord. In some sense, we think these elders represent that category of people. Somehow they're representative of the saints. That, that belief is kind of further um, solidified because they have these crowns. So, so too in the book of Revelation, we see the crowns are given to the overcomers. There's like five crowns mentioned in the Bible, crown of life, crown of righteousness, and there are others. But these crowns are, are pertain to the saints. So we don't know who these 24 elders specifically are, but somehow they're probably representative of this class of, of saints, of overcomers. But more importantly, I want you to notice what they're doing. Their identity is unclear. Probably don't want to spend too much time on that. But what are they doing? They're worshiping God. They're saying, worthy are you. You know that's what worship is? Worship means not just to sing. We can worship while we sing. But worship at its core means to ascribe worth to something, to point out the awesomeness of something. Okay, It's kind of like you, know, you go on Amazon and you see a five-star review. What's it going to say underneath it? This is why this thing is cool and you got to have one. Right, But if you see a one-star review, well, you probably don't want to buy this, right? I mean, why does God deserve the credit? Why is he awesome? Is he awesome? He's awesome. But why are they pointing out that he's awesome? Worthy are you to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things. And, there's a second reason, by your will they existed and were created. The holiness of God. You see, God created all things. And what that tells us is that God is holy. God is separate. He is apart from his creation. He is distinct from, superior to any created thing. And this includes Jesus. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is God. There's the creation, and then you have God. And God is distinct from, superior to his creation. It's one reason he's awesome. Okay? He's worthy. And secondly, we see something else that says, by your will, these things were created. Nobody made God do anything. Okay, God, because he is who he is, created everything. And that's everything that we can see and can't see, and I don't have time to go through that entire list of things, but just, just look around you for a moment and consider everything from atoms, molecules, Animals, people, species, the planets, the earth, gravity, laws of physics, chemistry, biology, the atmosphere, the conditions to support life, planetary alignments, solar systems, galaxies, time in which to put all of those things, laws to govern their order, their existence. He created all those things and holds those things together, Colossians tells us. And that right there, just if we just paused right there, and we don't even talk about other things about God, that right there, we could park on that and worship him for eternity. He's worthy. Like, how did he even do that? He's holy. He's apart. He's other. He's, his apartness is staggering. We have no capacity to understand it, how huge, how, how, how holy he is. And it's the four creatures that really kind of bring that out. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's so apart. He's so distinct. He's so above anything else that you could put to compare him to that it's like it bears repeating in triplicate. Holy, holy, holy. Never anywhere else in Scripture is any attribute of God mentioned in triplicate. 
other than here, where it says holy, holy, holy. And in kind of the sister passage of this in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is getting the same vision. By the way, if you want to compare notes there, go back and look at Isaiah 6. Isaiah records the same thing. He says these four living creatures are repeating holy, 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 nonstop. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's interesting that they say holy, holy, holy. They never change vocabulary. They don't say God is love, love, love. God is mercy, mercy, mercy. God is wrath, wrath, wrath. It never says that. It's always holy, holy, holy. He is apart. He is distinct. He's separate. He's above. But it's the holiness of God that is really kind of touches every other area of who he is. You know, God is, we talk about God being above, just distinct and apart in his creative ability. God is holy in that respect. But God is also holy in his love. There is nobody that loves like God. Nobody loves like God. It, I mean, when we read the Bible and we look at the picture of Jesus and how God loved us through Jesus, there's nobody that comes close. When we look at the mercy of God, there's nobody that comes close. No example that comes close to the mercy of God. There's no, no one that comes close to the, the justice of God. God is so just. He never messes that up. There's no judge, no process, no uh, legal system that can compare. God is holy in his creative, creative ability. He's holy in his justice. He's holy in his love. He's holy in his mercy. God is holy in every aspect of his being. And when we really start to grasp that, it can really kind of be a little bit frightening. When we realize who he is, he's not like us. He's not the big man upstairs. He's not like my buddy down the street. He's not my old man. He's not any of those terms that people kind of give to God, like he's, you know, the man upstairs. He is holy. He is distinct. He's above. He's separate. He's so far distant in, in some sense that he's unapproachable. But yet he loves us, and he sent his son to die for us, and through being born again into a relationship with God, now we have access to him who formerly was unapproachable. It's, it's kind of like God is both scary, but at the same time, he loves us. And I think that's such a picture that we need to grasp. And I, I was just thinking about that this week, and I was reminded of uh, C.S. Lewis. If, if you've ever read C.S. Lewis, he's, he's a pretty cool author, a British author. He wrote all the Narnia books and everything. C.S. Lewis was, was a believer, and he often worked into his stories pictures of God, pictures of Jesus. He would sort of use allusions to um, biblical things and truths, and he put them in his stories. And uh, in the Narnia series, you may remember if you've seen the, the movie or, or read the book, uh, Jesus, which kind of his uh, allusion to Jesus in the, in the book was, um, was Aslan, the lion. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen Aslan? And he's, he's the king, he's this lion. And so in many ways, the, the characteristics of Aslan were, were uh, meant to portray uh, Jesus. And there's this one scene in the movie which I thought really was uh, kind of spoke to me. The littlest kid, Lucy, she, she's talking about meeting Aslan, this lion, this great king. And she says, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And the answer she, she got was, um, was this, as if there's anyone who can appear before him without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. And then she says, well, then isn't he safe? And the answer she got from Mr. Beaver was, safe? Of course he's not safe but he's good. Like, man, that really, to me, describes God. Is he safe? When we read through Revelation 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, God is not safe. He is just. He is holy. He is apart. But he's safe when we have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And that is important. 
And so I would challenge you today, I mean, as we read through this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shake our understanding maybe of God as we read through these chapters. There's some stuff coming up that's kind of hard to read. It's a, little, it's a little tough. He's not saved, but he's good. He's good to me, and he's, he's good to you. And on the basis of our relationship with him through Jesus, okay, we can approach him and, and partake in his goodness. And so I just want to challenge you with that. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. I know there's a lot that we didn't touch on. But Father, that today we might understand in some small way your holiness. We'd understand more about who you are truly, not who we think you are, not who we wish you were, who you truly are. Lord, that we would understand uh, your justice, your, your wrath, but also your mercy, your love. Lord, and that we'd also wrap our minds around the command that you give us to, to also be holy as you're holy. Lord, help us in these things. Help us to understand. Help us to walk in these truths. Lord, it's in your name we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.